Is Luke Fickle in the hot seat? I think we know Phil Longo's on the hot seat. Is Luke Fickle? We're bringing in an awesome guest today to break it all down, break down the state of the Wisconsin Badgers football program and a little bit of what went wrong against the USC Trojans. Good evening, and thank you for enjoying it with the Six Pack, the Scotty Six Pack, the only podcast talking all things Wisconsin sports with you six days a week. I'm your host, Kendrick Summers. I cover the Wisconsin Badgers for Athlon Sports. You can find me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbrist, and follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack for the latest updates in Wisconsin sports. Yes, we are talking Wisconsin Badgers football today. Um, going to give you a little bit of the preview for what we got going on in the rest of the show this week. I am headed to Big Ten Men's Basketball Media Days tomorrow, as well as Men's Basketball Open Practice on Friday afternoon. Uh, so we should have some basketball nuggets out for you this week before we get back into football coverage on Saturday. So stay tuned until the end of the show. Uh, we're we're going to throw in a, an exciting announcement at the at the end of the show for for those of you that make it that long, or even if you want to skip to the end. Uh, I got I got an exciting announcement uh, for all of you that should hopefully. Uh, help enhance the experience of of watching the show, uh, enhance your your Badgers coverage, enhance your Badgers fandom moving forward. Uh, but we're going to be bringing in Dylan Graf, uh, the 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 head honcho for us over at All Badgers and, and Athlon Sports. Uh, also hosts the Talking Badgers podcast that you can find on your podcast platform of choice. Uh, formerly Badger Notes After Dark. Um, so wherever you're listening to this, wherever you're watching this, if you're watching us on YouTube, youtubecom slash at Scotty Six Pack, you can go find. Talking Badgers and find Dylan Graff, who we bring into the show next. And now we welcome into the show, and honestly, for the first time, I'm I'm surprised we've we have we've gone this long for the first time. Uh Dylan Graff, Dylan, thanks very, very much for for joining. I'm really excited. I can't believe I think we did this once over on what is now talking badgers, but it hasn't has not been enough. Yeah, honest. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, I honestly, I think you know this. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the work you're doing over here. So, uh, honestly, just happy to be here and uh, talk a little bit of Badgers with you. And 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 likewise, always the the cream of the crop over um, on the website, formerly known as Twitter, on talking Badgers uh, over on Athlon Sports and all Badgers is Dylan. So we're we're gonna break down a little bit. What I wanted to do is structure this conversation around the offense, the defense. Um, and then the real red meat of the conversation at the end, uh, of Luke fickle as a, as a whole, let's, let's start though, with what, what I think most people love, love to yap about these days <laughs> for the Badgers is, is Phil Longo, the offense. Um, because I think a lot of the conversation out of this past weekend is surrounded on the quarterback situation, scheme and play call. And there seems to be two sides to the camp for the quarterback debate, which is, well, it's your backup quarterback. Badgers have had to deal with extended time from their backup quarterback over the last uh, two seasons. Um, but you, I know, were saying early in the year, right? It's how many seasons in a row now have the Badgers had to rely on like starts or multiple starts from a backup quarterback in the last now, 20 now years or whatever? 11, 11 of 13. 11 of 13. So like, and this is where like my take on um, backup quarterbacks in the NFL is very different than my take for backup quarterbacks in, in college football, right? In the NFL, they probably don't matter. You want a guy who can steal you a win. Apart from that, if you're really relying on a backup quarterback to win you many games, you probably don't have a franchise quarterback to begin with. In college, you need lots of guys to contribute on your roster. That's why your roster is twice the size of an NFL roster. So uh, Dylan, the quarterback situation, like you said, 11 of 13 years, the Badgers have relied on significant co contributions from their backup quarterback. Is that a real excuse for the, for this offense at this point in time that it is still uh, looking to get its first 30 point game in a really long time? I, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't really think it is, um, you know, to a certain degree, like obviously, yeah, Tyler Van Dyke was your plan a, but you also went out and you hand selected Braden Locke and you've been grooming him to potentially, potentially be the future and you know you gave him every opportunity in the world he split reps with the ones for as long as he didn't mm -hmm. camp and you know they've chosen to claim that he is you know one b and that nobody in the locker room would bat an eyelash you know whether or not he was under center or if it was tyler van dyke so to me the answer is no uh you know in large part because even when they have had their top options have we seen tremendous amounts of success i i don't think we can point to many of them um this team still really hasn't even played four quarters of quality football offensively in the Luke Fickle era, arguably. So mm -hmm. to me, you know, 
no, it, it's not a that that's just a, a crutch that people are maybe clinging to a little bit. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say that, like, you know, that's it, it, you wouldn't expect that a, a backup would have a little bit of a drop off. Sure. But you, you've invested in this person. This is someone who you potentially viewed as, you know, the quarterback of the future. And so, no, I, I we haven't seen this offense execute no matter who is under center. And so I think at this point you don't get to use that excuse. Yeah, the the cheddar coming out of Saturday's loss to USC was like, all right, the Badgers with Braden Locke under center are one in six. And then with the preferred starting quarterback, the Badgers are eight and two in the Luke Fickle era, to which I said, oh, well, what are those? What are those eight wins? Which is the, you know, this Luke Fickle opening era win over Buffalo, which was gross the win over georgia southern which wouldn't have happened if uh davis brain had not thrown five interceptions in that game that was an (laughs) all-timer just just bonkers uh you got the win over purdue where you blitzed them in the first half last year a win over rutgers which like fine okay but then it's the rest are that win over nebraska which required a a crazy comeback and i (laughs) and a win in overtime now which like nebraska after losing to Illinois in overtime earlier this year, Dylan, Nebraska has not scored points in eight consecutive overtime games. But football gods, we got something out against them, it turns out. Yeah, because not only have they not scored points in eight consecutive overtimes, they've also not gotten a first down in any of those eight consecutive that overtimes. That is staggering. Just unreal, unreal luck. So somehow Wisconsin managed to, you know, fend off that those those demons in, in Lincoln. Um, the game was in Minnesota or in Wisconsin, but then they got the win over Minnesota with the, the Tanner Mordecai QB draw, you know, run, run, run for the victory. And then Western Michigan, which the Badgers almost lost and South Dakota, which was gross. Those are all eight wins over, uh, over what is not like all worldly opponents, all eight wins for the Badgers in Luke fickle era with their quarterback of choice. And I think you got what a total of two. If you count the Nebraska game, I guess three. And I don't think you really want to count the Nebraska game. It's three right. wins that you feel really good about there. Yeah. If yeah. you remove the pageantry of the ax, like what are you pointing to as the signature win of the Luke fickle era at this point? You know, I, I, I think, I think ax aside and just saying like the product of who you beat, I, I is it Rutgers? Is it still yeah. Minnesota? Like, I, I think your point is well taken They're Even when they've had their guys, it's not exactly like we're, we're lighting the world on fire. I mean, this is an offense that has struggled to eclipse 21 points a game mm-hmm. against almost anybody. Yeah. Uh, and I think the, the quarterback conversation, which I, I find, I don't, I don't think it's an acceptable excuse, right? Because like, like we've said, even when you have your quarterback of choice, it hasn't looked great, but I think the quarterback conversation can get you bundled into this fourth and short scheme conversation as, as well. I, I personally don't buy into the fourth and short under center versus shotgun conversation. I I think it may be there. There is a case here that the offensive staff is not, properly evaluating and not properly using the talents of its personnel by going under shotgun in those situations. And I don't know, Dylan, if you have a problem with these fourth and short shotgun calls or not, to me, the bigger issue is on, on the game on, on the call late in the game against USC, you have an end crashing incredibly, incredibly hard. They're not, they're not setting the edge at all. Because they know Braden Locke's not going to pull that ball. And whether that's because Braden Locke doesn't have the wherewithal to do it, I think it's probably because the the staff doesn't trust him to pull the ball there. And if that's the case, why are you going into shotgun there anyway? Um, does the fourth and short co- conversation get lumped into a bigger quarterback conversation for you? Does it tell you anything about Phil Longo? Or is it kind of a nothing burger to you? 
I think to me it's it's somewhere close to a nothing burger. And for me, the answer is that, you know, I, I've seen the statistics that are out there, you know, that essentially say that going out of the shotgun is slightly more efficient. Mm -hmm. To me, I think you throw it all out the window because it's got to be a case by case basis. Like if you're unable to execute what is necessary to obtain that first down, then at least maybe you have to reevaluate how you're going about it. I mean, We've seen twice this year them get thwarted on fourth and one. Um, the Alabama they ran a they it was a slightly different play call. It was different personnel. Um, mm -hmm. so they were trying something different, but if they're not able to execute, maybe you do have to evaluate other options. Maybe you have to try to pass ball. I I don't know. I mean, at this point, I think it's kind of sad regardless. But you're right. Like you're you can't you can't even keep a defensive end honest in a situation like that with Braden Locke and. Is that because you don't trust him? It's hard to say because against Alabama, there was an opportunity before Braden Locke threw the touchdown on fourth and goal uh, to Will Pauling where if he would have pulled it, or I mean, who knows what was asked of him, but if he would have pulled it, he would have walked into the end mm -hmm. zone. So I'm of the opinion that they probably are not trusting or asking him to do that. And maybe that's warranted because they're afraid of, the, of him potentially getting hurt and where that would leave them after – you know, potential brain lock injury, maybe, but uh, without even that threat, it just is really limiting. And I, I don't know. I think you have to pivot to something else at this point. If, if that's the way you're going to treat it. Yeah. Th it feels like there's a lack of a play off the play, uh, which for, you know, just football fans, if you're a Packers fan, watch this show, right? We, we talk about the play off the play that Matt LaFleur is a, a master of a, as a play caller. And that case where you, you can't keep, someone who should be setting the edge honest um there's there's just a lack of the play off the play and whether that's Braden Locke or or the scheme is is a big question I, I tend to put more blame uh, on the scheme which which brings us to offensive coordinator Phil Longo and I I was listening to a different different show um earlier today where someone made the point of if you flip the two halves against USC you feel better about the result and I sat and thought, okay, that's an interesting thought experiment because we did have the Packers game on Sunday where we kind of had that flip of those two halves, right? Um, the Packers comeback was unsuccessful um, as opposed to USC's. And I certainly felt not gross about that game. I think that's totally fair. Yeah, but the more I thought about it, I said, actually, no, because I don't think either half was a great performance by by the offense Anyway, if, if the first half of that game is the pinnacle of the Phil Longo experience, as we've seen it so far, we have a schemed up touchdown on, on a shot play by Braden Locke on, on the first drive, which is great. He also executed a great late drive. But like if the schemed up deep shot is like the the pinnacle of the consistency of the inconsistency, 50 percent passer of Braden Locke, like, OK, you also have another drive in there that's four plays punt. Your second touchdown was set up by a muffed punt. And if. The punt isn't muffed there. You're you're just out on another three and out, and you're bailed out by a one one play touchdown, eighteen yards by by Tui Walker. I don't know. It, it's if the pinnacle of this offense is three and out versus touchdown roulette. I don't think that's fun either. Um, what are your thoughts on on Phil Longo and, and you know is the first half something to take away positively from or is it? smoke and mirrors with you know three touchdowns on the board i think it's probably a little bit of smoke and mirrors i feel like we're romanticizing it a little bit because we're so starved for any form of <laughs> consistent positivity yeah. um you know it, we we entered the half up 11 with everything we're getting almost every break going our way outside of the opening drive in which they mm -hmm. they drove the field I, I didn't see something like, don't be wrong. They, they were able to sustain a couple of drives and it, it did materially look better than, than it has. But like it, this wasn't, this wasn't an all time Phil Longo performance in the first half. I just think we got a lot of breaks that went our way. Preston Zachman took the football away. Like we, things went right. Vinny Anthony did beat his man and, and to Locke's credit, he completed it. Mm -hmm. um, but th this offense right now, I, I really don't think outside of maybe the offensive line, I don't think you can really point to anything that is going well or anything that like, you know, sometimes you, you can see the thought process and understand like, gosh, it, it's close. 
And I know that Luke Fickle has continued to say that he feels it's close and it comes down to execution. And I just, I just don't think they're even really that close. And I, I'm not sure I even see a lot of upside for this turning around because they, they are not built to come back. Like if they, if they don't have that lead, they are not coming back in any scenario. Braden Locke is, is what he is at this point. I, I think he is a serviceable two who, you know, we're going to have to limp along throughout the season. And, and I think he'll somehow manage to throw exactly 50% completion percentage against absolutely everyone we play. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, Those Purdue defensive backs are really bad. And, and I get that he still has to throw, throw the ball, but like Purdue might have the worst defensive backs in the big 10. And all that defense does is play man coverage. I, I am maybe a little optimistic going into this weekend, which is something I haven't said for like a month. Yeah. I, I, the one thing I will say about Braden Locks, I do think he's a lot more willing to, to take the shots, you know, yeah. Tanner Mordecai is someone who held on to the ball for a long mm-hmm. time. You know, we have small sample size, but Tyler Van Dyke also held on to the ball a lot. We didn't see, didn't really see those shots. Braden is open to, to airing it out and taking them. Um, you know, this weekend, you know, got, you just hope that he can take advantage of, like you said, a secondary that's vulnerable. Um, Obviously, the run defense is absolutely horrendous. Yeah, I think they're giving up 240 rushing yards a game. Yeah. So if if we aren't able to, you know, by kind of ditching the the committee approach, as Luke Fickle has said, if we're not able to figure something out or capitalize on that, then boy, I, I just don't know. Like I, we can talk about till we're blue in the face. This team doesn't have an identity or n- nothing even close to it. I just want to see them pick a lane and lean all the way into it for better or worse. I just want to understand what they're what it is they're trying to even accomplish yeah and i think that that lack of just knowing what what this team is what it can hang its hat on builds into um what you said in your post-game appearance on locked on badgers with ryan herrings which was that we think we're headed towards a mutual separation between phil longo and the wisconsin football program which wait when you said that that phrase, that mutual separation that perked up something in my memory hole where I swear to God, I said that to somebody on some show somewhere in the last month, but I can't find it anywhere. So I got no, I got no receipt to, to bring up myself. Unfortunately. Um, the only receipt I have is from August where I said, like, I think Chris McIntosh's extension is probably the biggest blessing to Phil Longo, because I think that probably helps Phil Longo from getting fired. Um, I don't really believe that anymore. Um, there's clearly just something tenuous in that locker room between the I'm just here to please coach fickle comments and fickle getting the chance to very publicly say they're on the same page and decline to do yes, so. Yes, stepping it entirely. And, and then this and then this week saying like outright like we need to do something different with the running backs, like kind of coming out against the approach in the run game too. Yeah, I I just this after, is yeah, this isn't who Phil Longo has been at any single stop, and I, I'm not trying to absolve him. I, I think you know he carries a lot of he's got to shoulder a lot of the blame because I think last year was a lot closer to the version of him that he wanted to be here, and that mm-hmm. certainly didn't work either. That was the worst offense we've had in 19 years in terms of scoring. Mm-hmm. So, but this year, I, I do think you know I know Luke Fickle kind of you know said that he's not as involved in the offense, but I, I just refuse to believe that he doesn't have you know more influence on this product you know i and i think that phil longo is maybe alluded to i'm just here to please luke Luke fickle yeah you know if if we're gonna play a more methodical game if we're gonna slow things down if we're gonna like that's not who he's been at any stop and so i think that this has got to be to some degree a, a little bit of a power struggle and i don't think it's helping either party and so that's why i think maybe a mutual parting of ways is the best for both sides um you know, time will tell, but I just don't see, especially with this schedule, I just don't see things turning around or suddenly clicking with the pieces that we have left. Yeah, it, it, it's certainly, it just, something just feels like there, there is an unhappy marriage here. And, and I, unless results drastically change the vibes of, of the program in the next two months, I, I, I just don't know how it ends any, any other way. Um, but I want to move over to the defense because I think there's a different thought experiment here where I know you aren't in love with the wide receiver talent. And I think that we've been proven that that to be true. And and I don't think the tight end room is anything to write home about either. Um, 
there's some running back talent. There's an offensive line that while solid is not necessarily up to Wisconsin of old standards, uh, in my opinion. Um, I think the thought experiment though, is this team still has a defense that is ranked 27th by Bill Connolly's SP plus rankings in the country. I saw that. I was a little bit surprised. Yeah. Um, like there's an argument here that just competent, capable quarterback play elevates this team to being something like at the very least gets it back into the top half of the big 10. Right. Um, so is this, is the defense being held back by the offense in, in your opinion, or, or is there more concerns on the defensive side that I think are, that, that are getting minimized because so much of the conversations around the offense right now? You know, I, I think that is honestly a really good question. I do. I think that they're being held back by the offense probably to some degree, but I, I also think like, this is a team that is actually kind of dominating the time of possession this season and, and keeping them off the like USC is not a great example. USC ran, you know, whatever, 20 something more plays. That yeah. We did yeah. Week. Like say, say what you will about holding back USC's offense in, in the first half, but like USC moved the ball way better than Wisconsin did. Even in the first half, all but one of USC's drives ended in plus territory. And the only one that didn't ended at the 47. But. And they converted 11 of 17 times on third down. And at yeah. that point, you know, it's just hard to, Hard to say that defense isn't without their fault. Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't think there were any illusions that this defensive line was going to be anything special. I think that the 90th percentile outcome was them being passable. And then we mm -hmm. lost James Thompson Jr. And, mm -hmm. you know, that was obviously tough. But I think one of the areas that, like, I want to, you know, certainly apologize for my take on is, you know, I think the staff thought, and I certainly thought that this was going to be a drastically improved pass rush. And, mm -hmm. They, they were better against USC, sure, but I, I thought a lot of their pressure came due to coverage more than them getting after the quarterback quickly. Um, you know, the the pass rushers that we've invested in and Pius and Lowry, you know, they're going to be on the side of a milk carton here pretty quick. Like this mm -hmm. is, I mean, when you've got, you know, Daryl Peterson is a fine player, but he's someone you don't really look at as like a pass rush specialist when he's probably your best option. Yeah. Um, and quite frankly, Aaron Whip might even be the best outside linebacker on the team, and he's not a pass rusher whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was really wrong about about them in general. Um, I thought that they would be impactful, and I thought that would make a a big difference. But also, you know, the, the inside linebacker play has not been strong, and that's an area that I thought was going to be a point of strength. Jaheim Thomas yeah. has been a, a no show to, to a negative. I mean, this past weekend, no, it shows why the Arkansas staff just completely fell out of love with him down, down the stretch last yeah. year. Um, yeah, because he's, he's looked as, as he's making his presence known here as much as he's made his presence known when he was benched in, in Arkansas. Like it's yeah. not, it hasn't been good. I really thought that he would, you know, be far more impactful and maybe even be a potential weapon on third down um, from the outside, you know, getting, allowing a guy like Christian Allegro more snaps, you know, getting, some athleticism out there, but I just, I feel like I haven't seen it. And, you know, on top of it, like Mike Tressel, if you look at the defense he had successes with at Cincinnati, like those were really different personnel groupings than he's running here. And, you know, the whole meshing of the elite thing, like I understand the thought process, it didn't happen. And, you know, are they still working through that? Do they feel like they don't have the guys to run what he wants? I, I, I don't know, but it, it feels like, they're, they're just fine. You know, with, are there a lot yeah. of teams that would rather trade defensive? Probably. But when for a decade plus, you know, you were able to hold opponents under 100 rushing yards, almost almost guarantee every week. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was just a matter of what can you do in the secondary? I feel the opposite about this defense. Like, I I don't think Mike Trestle's seat is as hot as Phil Longo's. Like, I, I think to me, yeah. it's borderline a foregone conclusion that Longo is going to be gone after the year. And Mike Trussell obviously has an established relationship working with Fickle and had some success. So maybe that earns him a little bit more leash. But uh, no, I, I've not been impressed with this unit really as a whole. Like I, e even the secondary, which I think is strong. I think it's a strong secondary and I don't think people are going to remember it that way. Well, no, people, what people are going to remember is Hunter Wooler getting put in the spin cycle by Miller Moss. Which oh is... man, that, that one, that <laughs> broke me. That broke me. <laughs> Like that looked like if I tried to put a spin move on someone out there, that was, oh. that, that was, that was a tough, 
that was a tough blow. Yeah, tough luck, tough luck. Um, just not impressed. I, I I think what you're what you're hitting at was is where where I'm at, which is I don't have a problem schematically here. Like cards on the table, this isn't really that different than what we were doing with with Jim Leonard here, scheme wise. Yeah. Um, but they just don't have the talent right now. I, I mean, I I looked and. Look, I, I uh, certain corners of the internet did, did, didn't take too kindly to my my predictions ahead of the Western Michigan game, trying to sound the alarm bells on on the defensive line here. But like the pass rush here is fringe power five guys that were brought in by the previous staff and then like FCS transfer ups. And like on the basketball side, I've been as big of an advocate for transfer ups a, as anybody else um, trying to you know pa- pound that drum early in last offseason. Uh, early this off season, I should say, but like, I don't believe in them as much at the football level. Um, and especially at the power five football level. And yeah, it has, has not gone well here. And then, you know, like I said, I think some, some turnover luck in the first half, because yeah, you, you got some, some grown men who took, took a ball away in that half, but like, we know turnovers aren't, aren't sticky. It, they, they, that they statistically regress un- unless you're the Iowa Hawkeyes. Um, they had one turnover the entire season going into that game and it came in garbage time in week one. Yeah, it, it's the defense hasn't been awesome, but it's 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 not like we don't at least kind of see what they're trying to do here. Right. At least we can see they're trying to win through through defensive backs. Maybe they're getting hung out to dry a little bit too long. They don't they don't really have a pass rush. They don't have great defensive line line talent but we know that they've hit on at least some evaluation here like the evaluation for what i was saying about trans transfer ups before the evaluation on nizier for has been great the evaluation on tech and curtis has been awesome the evaluation on christian allegro has been awesome um i, I think overall on defense they're probably plus talent on the field compared to what they would have been if the coaching if the coaching staff had stayed the same before yeah, I, I would I would tend to agree with that. You know, I I the transfer portal, like no there are there are very few instances, or at least where Wisconsin is gonna be realistically involved with a player where you're gonna be getting a perfect product. I mean, you're getting damaged goods regardless. There's a lot of reasons people enter the portal, but um yeah, defensively I think they've hit on like Elijah Hills is somebody who I definitely yeah. I don't think I had super high hopes for. I no. I I would say I thought you know, 15, 20 snaps a game go in there. Don't be a liability is what I was hoping for. And yeah, that would have I been certainly easy. had higher hopes for John Pius. If we're talking some of these FCS, you know, definitely. From I, I thought that I thought that he would be explosive enough to, to provide some, especially on third downs and um, I j- just have, have not seen it uh, at all. You know, I, I agree with you in terms of football transfer ups, not translating quite as much. And I think that maybe the hit rate, um, you know, kind of shows that, that there might be something to that. Yeah. Um, well, we think that the defense probably has a little bit more to, to hang its hat on, even if things have been rough. Um, but let, let's talk about some players who used to be in the program for, for a second. Um, and, and the alumni chatter here, because I, I said after the game Saturday, um, and I think that my take here was a little bit mis- misconstrued by some folks. Um, but what, what I had said was that I think it's probably not the best thing for the program that every single week there are former Badgers dragging the coaching staff slash play style slash philosophy online. Not just fringe players either, but future pro Hall of Famers like J.J. Watt sounding off about shotgun and fourth and one and current NFL starters Braylon Allen and, and, and whatnot. This isn't me saying that former players shouldn't be doing this, that they are actively harming the program. And that's something they, they shouldn't be doing. I, I don't care about that. Um, by me saying it's probably not the best thing for the program. My take here is that every single week, seemingly, and, and we are 17 now 18 games into the Luke fickle tenure. Every single week, it seems that we are making grandiose statements about the state of the Wisconsin Badgers football program. Some of that is built into a new ish coaching staff. I, I get that some of that is going to be there. But if every single week we're having these meta level conversations, I think that should sound alarm bells about how things actually do look because you can lose football games and not have these kind of big conversations about 
coaching staff in hot seat and tenure. Look at, look at the Packers who lost Sunday and, and lost in, you know, a, a game where they got dominated early, right? We're not talking about firing uh, Matt LaFleur. We're not talking about benching Jordan Love. Like, what do you take from the, the alumni chatter here? Because for me, it just signals that like things just aren't good. And I, it, it's not the fault of the alumni here, but I think it's just a data point that says like, look, if we're seeing this if players in the program are seeing this, it just, it just feels gross, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like I, I, you know, maybe this is my most popular opinion, but I don't think all, I don't, I don't think you are what your record is in, in all instances. Like I, I wow. expect it to be two and two right now, you know, and there are a lot of people that are, you know, preaching patience and maybe I should have a little bit more, but if you can sit here and say, this is how you thought this two and two would look, I think, you know, that you'd be a liar because you, against Western Michigan, that was brutal without a, a lucky bounce we probably lose that game mm -hmm. and you know, S South Dakota. Yeah. They're a quality FCS program, like not taking anything away from them. That's a game that you should win handily or at least kind of pull away late in the game. That didn't happen. And maybe, you know, you're saying you're making too much of those two games and then you lost against the other two. Yeah. But when you look at the, the 17 games we've seen the Luke fickle era, the, it's, it's the same script every time, you know, there there's not been a four quarter performance against a single opponent, you know, where you can say like, man, offensively, it was just clicking or defensively, you know, just shut it down. Like, yes, there have been times like last year, we saw a lot of second half adjustments where Trestle was able to, you know, get, get blown up in the first half and then really, really pivot in the, in the second half. And that's all well and good, but this team continues to show us who they are. And I think that the alumni are just kind of screaming that it's time to believe them. Like there, there's, there's, there's real, there's real problems here. And, and I don't think it's just trying to, I don't think it's overreacting to point that out at this point. I think that's what's happening. You know, every single person, even these alum, nobody's rooting against Luke fickle. Nobody's rooting yeah. against the Badgers. Everyone wants the same thing. I want the same thing. We want them to be, to win every game they play from here until I'm 10 feet in the ground. But, but we're this this feels like a far cry from not just getting where we thought we were going under Luke Fickle, but even getting back to where we were at the end of the Paul Christ era. Yeah, um, do doesn't help that you then have um, Barry Alvarez going on ESPN radio this week. Yeah. All all one. but calling all but calling Phil Longo an idiot. Um, yeah, uh, tough look. So I want to I want to paint a, a picture to you, which was th this was the case that kind of sparked why, why we wanted to have this conversation in, in the first place, which is about Luke Fickle's job security and all of this, because I think you and I on face agree. The most likely outcome here is he is not getting fired this year. He's probably not getting fired after next season. Um, I, I will say, though, that the the take that I've seen around from some people, which is like. It's college football. Everybody gets four years as a head coach. That's just not true anymore. Like I, I remember when uh, Charlie Weiss got fired as the head coach of, of Kansas. My dad's a, uh, a Kansas alum, and I remember my dad gearing up there where they had won like I don't know two games in his four years there, and just being <laughs> because it's Kansas football, um, and just being like he's had four years at this point. His his uh, all of his recruits are in the program at this point. If it's not working, then you get rid of them, right? But like now. College football is different. It's it's different player movements, different money involved, whatever. Like, I don't think it is absurd to part ways with Luke Fickle after three years. A and if that happens, that happens. Right now, the money is probably too big. Yeah, and I would agree. Yeah. A and even after next year, the money is probably too big. Not to mention, I don't know that Chris McIntosh gets to make a second football hire as as, as athletic director. I, I think you're you you're spot on there. I mean, you you made a you paid at, at the time, you know, top ten money to a head coach, and then over seven years, that's that's not a that's a sizable investment. Yeah. In in who let, let's not let it be revisionist history. At the time, that's that's probably what it would have taken to get him, and he was a yeah. pull. You got him. You, you essentially you won the Luke Fickle sweepstakes over. There yeah. were a lot of other programs that also wanted him. This you know, was a guy I, that basically turned down Notre Dame a year ago, a year prior. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. On paper, this, this felt like a home run hire. And I think at this point, I mean, as much as with the, the product on the field, you can't be patient and it is frustrating. Patience feels like the only, the only option right now because of the investment that you made and the amount of money that's on the table. Yeah, I, I agree. Now let me paint you a picture to the contrary for the sake of conversation, which is a case where Luke Fickle loses his job at the end of this season. And I think first it starts with him losing the locker room. Uh, yesterday, the thing that stood out to me the most at midweek interviews with, with football players after practice was Cade Iacomelli saying that although he stays off of so social media, he had heard about the debate about the fourth and short situation lining up in shotgun because other players in the locker room had been talking about that conversation. And I don't know if that's those players laughing that off saying they, don't, you know, fans online, Loeb and I don't know what they're talking about, or if there's a crack in the foundation leading to, you know, that chatter from outside getting into the locker room. Additionally, we have the Braylon Allen tweet saying, I'm going to hold my tongue for now, but y'all going to see me on a podcast one day explaining exactly what was going on in my last season there. That that getting reshared onto Instagram, and then you get Bryson Green, Kyan Barry Johnson, Anelu Lafayette, and Rob Booker, all current players on the team, all, all liking that. So the case for Luke Fickle getting fired this year starts with him losing the locker room. Do, do, I, do I have you so far? Yeah, so far, absolutely. All right, all right. Second, a case where Chris McIntosh doesn't believe in the recruiting upside of the program. Fickle's first two full classes, right? So the 2024 class that that's signed in his true freshman right now was ranked 23rd in the country by the 247 composite rankings. The 2025 class that he is currently building is currently ranked 27th, which, you know, both solid fringy top 25 classes. Um, certainly classes that are like good enough to help you get to a college football playoff at Wisconsin, I think. But under Paul Christ, although he didn't start as hot in recruiting as Luke Fickle has started at Wisconsin. And then obviously Chris, er, Chris class has dropped off. This is not a pro Christ take by any means. Um, but when he was recruiting at the height of his powers, the 2019 class was ranked 28th. The 2020 class was ranked 26th. The 2021 class was ranked 16th. It's not like there's a big jump in recruiting here from what we've seen Wisconsin do before. Um, is is there a case in your mind beyond just ranking stars that we should feel better about the recruiting under Luke Fickle than than we we have seen so far? I, I feel like my answer could be yes if I felt like they had done a better job of identifying maybe some portal talent. Maybe that's not fair. Yeah. No, it's maybe it's not one to one. Um, yeah, I, I feel like they on paper have recruited potentially better athletes, you know, maybe higher ceilings. Um, but we also haven't seen enough. You know, I, I, I we don't know what their vision is. Like, I, yeah. I don't even know how they want to use these pieces yet um, to know for sure. I, I, I think there there might be some more upside in, in what they've got coming up. But you're right, like at least in terms of rankings and. Yeah, I, I know everyone's going to say stars don't matter, but they also kind of do matter. If no, you they matter. They're you, predictive, man. Like, look at the NFL draft. They, the stars are predictive. <laughs> but you're not, you're not going to hit on 100% of them. There's always going to be outliers, but they kind of do matter. Like, yeah. there's a reason that no team has won the national title since the college football playoff without at least a 50% blue chip ratio. Mm -hmm. like, you, you need you need some, some dogs. And Luke Fickle, you know, and their, to their credit, they hit that 50% in their first class. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but also there's kind of the flip side is, I, I know, are you able to keep these, these players together and these classes together long enough for it to materialize in a meaningful way? Because a lot of them are not stepping onto the field as 18 year olds. You know, it, it's encouraging that some have already, um, and that we've seen that shown flashes. So maybe they have been good in their talent evaluation of, of prep recruits, but if you can't guarantee them to be here three, four years, is it going to matter? Yeah, and I and I think the the idea of potentially you know parting ways with Phil Longo and having a hard reset on the offensive side of the ball to now I guess who knows what it would look like in in next season 
potentially losing talent, potentially taking yourself a step back from the classes that maybe you feel good about already and then having to backfill again through the portal, I think that probably doesn't help Luke Fickle's case long term. Like, I, even though I understand that the practical, like, logical solution there is more patience, it probably hurts them in the short to medium term even more. Um, but okay, so then if, if if we don't believe in their recruiting, hypothetically, if the locker room is going to hell, then what's left is like this institutional support for Luke Fickle, making sure money doesn't dry up for the athletic department. And what I've noticed over the last week is that you don't hear as many people online saying the bull streak doesn't matter anymore. That was a really popular, you know, online take, I think, over the last year or so, being like, at least we can hang our hat on the bull streak. And now all of a sudden that I think people see that it's actually in jeopardy. I think it is five alarm fire, the bull streak, the bull streak, the bull streak. Um, and I think people are starting to realize that like stakeholders in the athletic department actually really care about this. And I think if you are the head coach of this football program, I think you have to care about it because if you are trying to position Wisconsin as something that can compete with the Oklahoma, Georgia, Ohio States of the world, the bull streaks, all you have right now, the only programs in the country with a longer one than you are Oklahoma and Georgia. Ohio State has the seventh longest in the country. Your third, keep in mind, Wisconsin is third. Keep in mind, Ohio State at seven. Their streak is half as long as Wisconsin's. Do you know when? Do you know who was the head coach when uh, Ohio State uh, didn't finish with a high <laughs> enough record to make a bowl game? I do, and his name is Luke Fickle. Um, oh, you yeah, know what they went the year after he was gone? Um, oh, no. <laughs> yep. That's... <laughs> Yeah, um, but like, if the wins aren't there, you're smashing, you're you're breaking that tradition, and like you're an outsider. I think that fairly or not, that certainly hurts you because the people who are gonna make sure you keep your job or don't keep your job are insiders, are people who've been here for a long time. I. I got a, I got a question that I think plays well off this. I'd love to ask your opinion on. Uh, yeah. Do you think, let, let's say that Greg Ard and the basketball program make the tournament. It, it doesn't have to be a real flashy year, but they, they back into the tournament. Yeah. Do you think what's going on with Luke Fickle right now and Ooh. the way that they pull the plug with Chris and, you know, kind of that sustained success, do you think that buys Greg Gard more time potentially or, or more goodwill with the athletic department? The way I would flip this question on its head would be, would we say the same thing about Mike Hastings and the hockey program and the men's hockey program, right? Because we did the same, the, the Luke Fickle, Mike Hastings thing with the hockey program is the same move that has worked out completely different ways. Yeah. And like, I get that like people don't care about the hockey programs as much as like I do, but ultimately the reason they had to pull the plug on Tony Granado is because nobody was showing up to games and that program was bleeding cash. And to make the athletic department work, they need the men's hockey program to break even. Um, and so like, well, I do think, right. Maybe Greg guard is a source of stability there, as opposed to what the change in Luke fickle would be. I, I don't know. D does it make you feel like, well, but we know we can make a move and things can work. We just missed here. The entire country missed here. I don't know. I, I do think when I'm not trying to get out of answering the question, um, I, I think my answer is, yeah, I think it makes them think twice about, about Greg Gard. And I think probably I think gives so them more, more of a leash. I, I was probably of the opinion anyway, that as long as he makes the tournament, he keeps his job. Um, right. and I think if he misses the tournament, he doesn't keep his job, but if he doesn't miss the tournament and things look this bad for the football program, does Macintosh want to have, this is where like the human dynamic comes into it for me and, and other people trying to keep their jobs come into it for me. I think it's a very interesting thought experiment for Chris McIntosh to then potentially have not just one, but two hires in the athletic department that are potentially make or break for his own job. And how does he assess his own personal risk? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. You know, I, I think his, his wagon is so hitched to Luke fickle that, you know, I, I think they're 
short short of like you said the locker room being lost beyond you know bringing back that like there's no faith that there's a mass exodus that he gets through this year unscathed and quite frankly next year as well but uh I, I think he's losing a lot of goodwill with the people who truly care and fund what's going on here and uh you know, I, I think a lot of these former players, you know, kind of voicing their opinions, mm-hmm. it's not coming from nowhere. And I, I can tell you there's a lot of former players that uh, it's not just what's on the football field that's left them not believing necessarily in Luke Fickle. Uh, well, that feels as as ominous a place to leave it as, as we possibly can. Um, Dylan uh would love for you to tell folks where to find more of yourself thanks so much for coming on is there also any anything else that you would want to add to the conversation before we go no man uh, it was just nice to sit down and talk some badgers with you uh i think you're probably one of the best voices out there for this you're natural um i i, I wouldn't recommend anybody out there follow my work anywhere mostly just incoherent ramblings all over the internet um you know but uh just just kind of it's hum- it's humbling that anybody takes even a moment to to listen to me talk Incoherent ramblings are most of the internet, so you're you're certainly uh, with with the rest of the pack there. Uh, Dylan, thanks so much for coming out. This guy six pack. We'll we'll talk again very soon. Have a good one, man. That was Dylan Graff, also of Athlon Sports, all Badgers. Uh, big, 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 big thanks to him for joining the show. Uh, it was a very fun conversation to have. And look, um, things are you know not not the best, but I I am still optimistic that this Badgers football team can can make a make a bowl. I think you got to beat Purdue. You got to beat Northwestern and Minnesota. Um, and then you got to get one of the two at Rutgers or Nebraska. And we'll see, we'll see. Uh, but thanks Dylan for joining the show. I'm going to be at big 10 media days in Rosemont, Illinois tomorrow. Uh, hopefully getting a good interview out of that, that we can share on the show here, uh, in, in full length with, um, a current Badgers player who will be uh, attending media days tomorrow. Uh, look, looking forward to that. Hopefully some other good nuggets out, um, very soon. Which brings me to our exciting big announcement. Uh, Starting today, uh, as you are getting this, we are adding a new exciting subscription tier to the show, uh, to this community. This show, still 100% free, still always going to be free. But starting today, we we are going to add, for just $5 a month, you're going to get even more of me. More, More of my notes from practices, from conference media days, like tomorrow, uh, from interviews, everything that doesn't fit neatly into a story that I'm going to publish on Athlon Sports or publish here on the show, you're going to get that content, my my full notebook from a day in in Madison, in Milwaukee, in in Rosemont, all of that full upload uh, into our new subscription tier of the show that you can find at scanisixpack.substack.com. For just $5 a month, you're going to get that as well as a live chat with me and other subscribers that you're always going to be able to go into and ask me questions, ask me whatever happens to be on your mind that day, uh, and, and I'll get around it and give you my thoughts if if I have an answer to it um, or not, or let you know if I might be able to track down an answer to that question. For those of you who've been around for a while, you know this show originally wasn't a show. Uh, This was a newsletter when I started doing this uh, two years ago now, Uh, and it it is basically a full two years at this point, which is exciting time to to be back in the driver's seat doing this and adding something on to this. So if you go to scanisixpack.substack.com, you're going to be able to subscribe uh, for just $5 a month, get my full notebook from a day, uh, if that's football practices, a football game, uh, a, a football interview. Whatever that might be, you're going to get that full notebook as well as live chat with me. If I have something that I am learning in real time or something I'm trying to get a lead on in real time and might have something that I can share behind a little bit of a wall to some closer folks, uh, but can't quite share yet with the rest of the public. So if you are interested in getting real time updates from me tomorrow at Big Ten Media Days, for example, subscribe. Subscribe for five bucks. Uh, just head to scannysixpack.substack.com. Uh, we'll also have that linked in the podcast description, and you'll be able to get my full thoughts, full notebook, uh, full subscriber-only chat, and you're always going to be able to get that for five bucks a month. 
moving forward, hopefully we can add even more uh, content for y'all, but for just five bucks, you're always going to get that. That'll never get taken away from you. Uh, and it should be an invaluable resource as we go forward into the big, big, big basketball season coming up. So uh, thanks to all of you for making this project possible. Really looking forward to it. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in our subscriber only chat. So thanks as always for listening to the show, for subscribing to uh, the members only notebook. And we will talk to you all again very soon on Wisconsin.